started. Um, section six, we're covering. We're, we're in section six. We're covering some uh, the mind levels. We we kind of mentioned consciousness. This is going to get more into the levels of it. Um, really, there's only one mind, just like there's one brain, but there's lots of different parts to the brain, and there's different parts to the mind. So we're going to be getting into that today. And uh, I'm always messing with words, and this came to me uh, a while back. And it's the concept of meditation is supposed to put you in the now, that space right in the center of the past and the future. is like you're not in any time, it's the now. And the cool thing about, if you look at time, those two words in the center is I am. Um, so if you can be right in the center of the past and the future, not focused on either one, you're, that's the only time that you really are yourself. So most of the time, we're actually living in the past or we're projecting our, percep our expectations onto the future of what we want to happen there, or we're living from past programming from past experiences. So time is a concept, uh, which is basically a form of the ego. So everything, in, everything that we talk about verbally is a concept of spirituality. Um, real spirituality can only be experienced. It cannot be completely verbally expressed and talked about. It's impossible. Um, what comes to mind is that movie Contact. Everybody saw that movie Contact? Um, and uh, Leslie, I can send you a copy of this too. You can copy that down, but I'll send you a The in the movie Contact, you know, the, where they make that machine to go see the aliens or whatever. And the preacher in the very beginning, which is um, Jodie Foster's kind of boyfriend, in the beginning they were kind of, and he talked, to, he was a, a, a preacher, and he was talking about his spiritual experience. And he said it was hard to express that. It was kind of interesting at the end of the movie, she had this experience, I would call it spiritual, and she was unable to fully express it and give it to somebody. So, you know, she... She understood how, where he was coming from by having that experience herself. So anything that you read in a book, anything that you see, anything I say or anybody else says, is the finger pointing at the moon. And you'll never have your own experience unless you, you try to see the moon on your own. Everything's meant to point you in that direction, but you have to have a direct experience with it. You cannot have somebody else tell you what that is. And religion is doing that. When you get caught up in any type of religion, I don't care what kind of religion it is, it's the finger pointing at the moon. And it's somebody else's experience of that. And you cannot have a direct experience of it unless you use that to direct you towards your own experience. But you cannot use that as your truth. Everybody's different. Everybody's going to have a different experience of spirituality. Everybody's going to have a different understanding. And it's meant to be personal, not impersonal. So if you follow a religion, and that's the, your truth, or you take that as your gospel truth, then sometimes that interferes with your ability to have a direct experience with God, with the universe, whatever you want to call it. So, long story short, is every concept is something trying to express something. So anything you read in a spiritual book is a concept. It's a mental, you know, here comes a spiritual experience to the right brain, which is not limited, the feminine brain, which is the open, receptive womb, experiences things or is open to experience in the right brain, the masculine brain, like Adam, the representation of the masculine energy is always labeling everything. So an, a concept is a labeling. It's trying to make sense of what's hard to make sense of. But if you get caught up in the left brain, it interferes with your ability to experience it anymore. Um, so you, you need both. Over identification with form, the material, um, the material reality form uh, disconnects us from the spirit, our essential self. So it's like a two-way two-way street. You can be um, too caught up in into the physical realm that your spirituality seems to disappear. Like last week, we talked about that the Garden of Eden isn't some place on the planet; it's the entire planet. And God didn't kick us out of the Garden of Eden. Our inability, or our judgments, when we ate from the tree of good and bad, the knowledge of good and bad, which means judgment, as soon as we took on judgment, and we all have judgments within our mind, we judge people, we judge whether something is good, we judge it whether it's bad, to the degree we have judgments in our heart is to the degree that we're disconnected from the spiritual aspect of life. Because you cannot be one with something when you're judging it. 
because judging it is cutting it and separating it from you. So um, if two, if you if you um, uh, associate yourself too much with the material world, then you can disconnect from the spiritual world. The only true moment now, which is the only true moment, is now in this moment, is a fine uh, razor's edge resting between the part, uh, the past and the present. I'm having a problem reading. <laughs> this is the only space where the essential self, the only I, can be found. <clears throat> it's like what's one of meditations about is like being in that little space where you are now, where the only real thing is. And when you're meditating or in that space, what happens is every, for every amount of meditation that you fall into that space, you have to be in that space though, then certain programs can be neutralized or erased completely and it stops your projection. So any moment that you can be in the now, you diminish some of the stuff that you've taken on, which is false. So the mind. Only, uh, you only have one mind, but it is broken into separate parts so that it can be discussed and analyzed. Here are the five major parts of the body. Um, I made it open then. When I first did the, this is like the fourth edition of my thing. When I first did it, I made it like a complete oval, a closed circle, um, to represent the, the consciousness. And then it came to me that it's really open-ended. So at the bottom of the picture is where you see God, unity, and oneness. And the arc up, the very tip of the arc, is, is the, the consciousness self, that's the ego. It's what you're conscious of, what you're aware of. Um, and the subconscious is below that. Then you have the sub-sub. We're going to go into these pieces. And then you have the superconscious, which you can actually say that's your conscience, the superconscious. And then you have where well, you're one with God. And um, what happens with that experience is the conscious mind thinks itself separate from God. And in between, in between our connection to God is our subconscious. And the subconscious is full of all the crap we've taken in our life as being a real thing. Typically, they're, they're the judgments that separate us. They're the judgments tough, that separate us from God. What's your name? Um, Margarita. Margarita. Nice to meet you. I have a pamphlet, but I'm, I'm out of them. So, <laughs> okay. so um, we're going to right now. We're going over the different levels of consciousness and how we get separated, or we never get separated from God. Our perception is what separates us from God. I'm trying to see if I had a picture here. I've drawn this before. Oh. So this is another representation. Why I left it open-ended, you've probably heard the kind of Zen metaphysical aspect that it's like, uh, you know, there's, there's one ocean, but there's lots of waves in the ocean, right? Well, you could say each personality is like a wave that rises up, has a certain amount of life, goes on for a certain amount of time, then dissolves back into the ocean. But while the wave is up, it, it feels like it has its own aspect of separateness, um, but it's still part of God or unity. So these, this is why I left it open into the conscious mind is where we begin to look out from the separate perception and look at each other as if each one of us is separated somehow, okay? Not realizing that there's like this sea of energy that connects every one of us and that every one of us has very similar issues that we're dealing with and going through. Um, and to the degree of your separation is, the, is to the degree that you can bring negativity into the world. Um, we all have within us the beast, so to speak, and you've heard of 666 being the beast, right? The number of the beast most people have in, in religious text. Well, there's seven major chakras, and the sixth chakra is right here. And the sixth chakra, what's another name for the sixth chakra? The third eye. So that says, what, there's three eyes instead of two, right? So what if you assigned a number to each one of the eyes? You would get six, six, six. Okay? When we view the world through a separate view, where we're looking at things left and right and we're judging this bad and this bad, we 
separate our consciousness. It's called duality, this is what most people call it. I call it polarization. Polarization is more actual than duality because polarization indicates a negative and a positive, right? So we're judging the world. Just like Genesis said, when Adam, Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and bad. That simply means they ate from the tree of judgment, what was considered good and bad. And in doing that, they fell from grace. They fell from this upper chakra where God unity was experienced into the lower realms where we feel like we're separate. So the degree that we're walking around with this views of things being separate is to the degree that we all have, we do beast-like things. And that's where things like abuse come from, physical, even horribly sexual things. All those horrible things come simply from the perception of the split mind that it is somehow separate from another. Think about it. How could something horribly be done to somebody unless you somehow think they are separate from you? Right? You have to have a separation. As So the degree that somebody does something neg or is able to do something negative to someone is to the degree that with which they are separated within themselves. How they to the degree that they feel that they are separate from God and everyone else. So then you have the subconscious, um, the sub-sub, and the superconscious, which are between you and God, unity, and consciousness. So in meditation, uh, you transcend this, if you can get into that space of being right now in the moment, no past, no present. You, you dive down into this, and you can have these really blissful experiences, and you can come back with knowledge, right? When you dream, when you go to sleep at night, there's some of that happening. Because when you dream, your, your conscious mind goes to sleep, right? And then you dive down into this other thing. The thing about dreams, though, if you're not consciously, if you're not using this to take the journey, then what happens when you wake up, if, the, if you let this go to sleep, meditation is you're trying to keep this aware, and then you're diving down into this at the same time. So when you come back up, you're completely aware of what happened, right? Which is really cool, because you can bring up awesome things. When you sleep, however, it's quite different. You've, your conscious mind, right, when you go to sleep, you know how you don't remember everything? You still do the same journey. You still dive down into the oneness, but when you come back up, you translate things based on, based on past experiences and this and this, and you make, you make dreams up. But if, if, that pro if you were conscious during the process, there would be no need for dreams because you'd have a direct consciousness. Because dreams, why do you think they're interpretable? Because what you're doing is you're interpreting what your con unconscious part of you made up, the story. But if you could remember it, it'd be just like a sentence, like, you know, God is telling you, okay, in this part, if you're meditating on a certain aspect of your life, or just whatever it is, if you're meditating on that, you could get direct information, just like a sentence. But what happens with your mind, you go down here on, when you're asleep, that part of you goes down here, when, on, when you start to re-emerge to your conscious mind, you're filtering through all your unconscious things, where most of our filters are. Mommy and Daddy did this to me, my perception of women is this, this, and what happens is we get information filtered. We've basically messed it all up, or put it into a jigsaw puzzle, be it a dream or something like that. All those... Huh? Stuck it in a word yeah, yeah, like those little games where you try to figure out what it is. And, and this is, most of our horrible stuff is in the subconscious mind, so we, it gets distorted as it comes back to the conscious mind. Uh, but that all arises because we feel like we're separate. And the more you be, the more you kind of meditate, and you more you just try to be more aware that you're connected to everything, and there's never been a separation from God. If God is everywhere, omnipresent, right? Then that, what does that mean? God is everywhere. People tend to try to take omnipresence and then add an aspect to separation. If God is omnipresent, means God is everywhere, including inside of you. Not yeah, to that degree is. I mean, if, if other that otherwise you have to admit that God is not omnipresent. If God is omnipresent, it period means God is everywhere. And if you try to say something else, then you take away the very aspect of God being omnipresent. Like I said, why the whole concept of be, us being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, which, which remember is not a place on the planet, it is the planet. Then we didn't get kicked out of the Garden by God. Our perceptions, when we started judging things as separate or negative, that's what make, get, give us these blinders. So when I look at somebody, I'm viewing them through my blinders. If I'm going to sleep at night and I'm going down and getting this information from God, I'm viewing it through my blinders. So I get it mixed up. If I can remain conscious and go beyond my consciousness to that, it goes beyond my filters. So the worst thing that we have is our unconscious mind where most of our stuff resides. And another way to look at this is like an iceberg sticking out of the water. 
The tip of the iceberg is the least bit of the problem. On an iceberg, 90% of its mass is below the surface. The Titanic wasn't sunk by anything above the water, it's what was below the water, which is, to me, kind of just a, metaphys a, a collective metaphysical reflection of, it's not what we're conscious of that sinks our ships, it's what's below the water that sinks our ships, literally. And if a spiritual journey is about getting into what, what's in the subconscious mind that keeps manifesting in the world, because what's ever in our consciousness, this whole complete aspect here, is what manifests at the tip of our world. Because these two people are experiencing this world out here, which seemingly looks separate from God, but can never be. Because if God is everywhere, then, right? <clears throat> and this is just, remember, remember how I started this? It's just a concept. I'm having to use concepts to make the thing make sense. But even this falls short, right? It's like somebody tried to explain ex an experience with God, that a personal experience. It's hard to explain because it is a personal thing. It's a personal experience. So even this concept is lacking because it's trying to draw a picture of what's happened. And it, and it lacks because it's not about going in and out. Or it, it's everywhere. So, so this lacks this, this in be, to be known because no matter what you read in any kind of spiritual book or hear from any spiritual person, it's going to be lacking because it's a concept. It's hard to give somebody a direct experience. You have to work for that yourself. Um, again, it's, every, it's the finger pointing at the moon. Don't mistake the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. <clears throat> Let me go back and read this because it's a little bit easier to see. Um, all these sub, sub, subconsciousness are levels of the mind that you filter communication between the conscious part of you and your soul self. The soul self is like the super conscious. There's a little bit of aspect that's it's got higher knowledge that is just barely separate from God. It knows it's one with God, but it still has an aspect of an identity of being separate. Okay? Between that is our sub, sub, and our sub. Those are the ones that screw everything up. Your tapes, your viral programs, the things you experienced in childhood, are located in your subconscious mind, which means that you are filtering information through your perceived truths, which, remember, perceived is the key word there. It doesn't mean it's true. It's what you perceive. Until these subs are cleared out, communication between your soul and your conscious mind is limited because you're, you're, you can get straight up advice from your higher self, from, for using another word, or information straight from God, but you're going to filter it. Because of what you expect, what you perceive. It's only, you can only hear truth when the subs are cleared out. When the subs are completely cleared, and there's a Zen saying that says, when the subconscious mind is conscious, you are one with God. <clears throat> so the subconscious mind is where all the clutter is, and until that's cleared out, um, complete knowing is always going to have a, is always going to have some percentage of an iffy feeling. You know how in your life when you're about to do something, and you're kind of like, eh, not sure about it. That means that you've got something in your subconscious that's interfering with you from being able to see it clearly. Because if you could see it clearly, you could see it how God is trying to show it to you, you would know. There would be no doubt. Here is where the doubt is. Doubt is in the subconscious mind, and doubt is linked to all this stuff that we've collected from our parents, preachers, teachers, peers. It's everything. And it's like what I talk about, Adam and Eve, the poisonous apple. The poisonous apple is judgment. It's, it's, a, it's like a falling asleep. It's like, you could actually say like uh, Snow White, who bit the apple and fell asleep, right? It, that, it, it puts us to sleep in, in our awareness, in our consciousness. And what happens is, you know, it's been passed on, passed on. Our parents eaten a certain amount of um, illusion and unknown, and then they pass it on to us and on and on. Just like um, your environment is a huge factor. Like, imagine someone being born into a family that's very, very uh, prejudiced, very, very, um, you know, restrict. Let's say they're born into something, even violence, like a KKK member back in the 60s, right? Let's say somebody's born into that environment. It's like, as soon as you're born, you're fed the negativity that's coming from them, right? And uh, it's a horrible thing to be in because then that person, unless they're somewhat conscious, the consciousness is key here. You have to be somewhat conscious to be able to change and enlighten yourself. So um, that's why I talked about, it's been a while since I talked about this, but to throw this in, there's like been expansions of awareness on the planet. Buddha, Christ, uh, Buddha consciousness came in before Christ consciousness came in. Buddha consciousness was about opening your mind to being aware of what you're thinking and feeling right now. Christ consciousness came in after that. And Christ consciousness was about, you have to be aware of what you're thinking so that you can start changing how you want to see things or how you want to really see the truth so you can embody it. 
You can't try to embody it if you're asleep up here. It's impossible. Because you've got to be able to be able to choose what you're aware of. If, you, if the awareness is missing, you cannot embody it. And if somebody tells you something, you still cannot embody it until you can really, really consciously understand it. And if you don't try to get your own truth, you know, if you, if you look at somebody as telling the gospel truth, you're not going to get the exact truth. And you're not going to be able to fully embody the truth. Um, unite the subs. Wait, until the subs are cleared out, communication between your soul and the conscious mind is limited. Another way of saying that is until your filters are cleared, true knowing is replaced by feeling. Your feelings of truth are only a percentage of the truth limited by how many tapes, which are just your past things that you believe in, you have in place. So whenever you're half-half wishy-washy, should I get out of this relationship, should I do this, should I do that, you're questioning, questioning, the answer is always there because there's no separation between you and God, right? So if you're questioning, questioning, and you're like, God, why aren't you answering me? Well, the answer is coming. You're unable to see it because you've got the blinders on. Just like you cannot see the, the beautiful paradise that we live in, and we sit here and try to kill each other because we cannot see, we have blinders on, we cannot see the beautiful place we live in. <clears throat> At this time, we will only be discussing the consciousness, the tip of the iceberg, and the subconscious. Those are the two main things. Just know that, that there's like a super consciousness, which is like your higher self, and the God consciousness. But you still have to communicate with them through the subs. The more, the more crap you have in the subconscious mind, the less you're able to get in touch with your higher self. Okay? And the higher self is an aspect that's directly connected to God and has a higher knowing. So, I, it, so this realm here would be your conscience too. It's things that you've learned through this lifetime that tell you, don't do that, that's bad, do, you know, this is better. Your consciousness is located here too. So if you have a bunch of tapes here, it also means you're disconnected from your conscience. And there's lots of people walking around that do that. Um, the statement you have here, until your filters are cleared, true knowing is replaced by feelings. Yeah. Okay, so my interpret I, I'm interpreting, interpreting that yeah. uh -huh. as, okay, obviously we all walk around with, you know, gunked up filters. That's right. just the right. human experience. So we feel instead of being conscious i'm not yeah. getting that cuz you want to feel reality right but what what what, 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 um, what i'm trying to get at is when okay i'll go back to what i was saying about let's say you're struggling with something right. i want to i want to change this job and you're like questioning when you when the feeling is wishwashy when you're kind of stuck in the feeling realm mm -hmm. and there's a not knowing that's what i'm referring to okay if it's a wishwashy feeling then that tells you that you're disconnected. Sense of uncertainty. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's what I was gonna say. Like um, something that I would experience. It's like um, you're so focused in your mind. Like one thing that I at least knew uh -huh. was uh, that you're not your mind. So it's kind of like you're focusing on your mind and this feeling and making it more intense. Right. But your body, like I said, feeling is telling you, "Hey, listen to me. I'm yeah. the one that's giving you the answer, not your mind." Right. Because um, if I would be like upset, I would be so focused here, but then. I came to this awareness that I start tightening up, and I was like, "What's going on?" Like, mm -hmm. what is this telling me? And that's kind of like, yeah, that's and that's yeah. that's perfectly right on. Now the word is tricky because I'm trying to explain something. Yeah. I'm using feeling here, and the feeling that you what's your name again? One more time, Margarita. Margarita, I should remember that. Okay, so Margarita and Tracy, what they're talking about, the feeling, and I don't know why it's confusing because you should be more in touch with your feelings more than your thoughts. What I'm trying to refer to is when you're struggling over something and you're caught up in the storm of your feelings and you're, and you're caught up like in the stormy, stormy sea of your feelings and your thoughts all turning, turning, when there's a not knowing and a calmness to the situation, you know that there's something in the unconscious mind that's preventing you from seeing the truth. Because if that was out of the way, you would be in touch with your heart, which is telling you exactly what the situation is about, and your mind would be one. Because the whole idea is not just to be in your heart, but it's to have the complete balance of Buddha and your heart. Because Christ is about the heart. You've got to have the blend of left and right brain, mind and heart. They work together. It's kind of like you're not aligned with, your, with yourself. Exactly. And, and we're all like that. We're all like these trees that blow in the wind. Any amount of wind, we're like, <sighs> all over, right? And we're not holding our center. And if you're trying to, you know, and again, this is limitation. Concepts are limitation because it's... Spirituality isn't about climbing a ladder, which can be misconceived, but imagine you're trying to, to do that. Maybe you're trying to climb something in the wind, and you're being blown all over the place. 
you know, you, it's hard to stay focused on what you want when you have all this turmoil around you. And drama's like that. We, if we, the more turmoil you have around in your life, it just tells you the more stuff inside your head that's stirring up the ocean. The conscious mind. The conscious mind is the part of you that is focused on thinking and analyzing. Just like Margarita is talking about. You really focus, focus, focus on something. We tend to mess it up more than fix it because we're like, you know, I'm going to try to take this all apart, right? And, but we have to use some of that because your thinking process is what's associated with your stomach. It's what you chew things up with. So when you're thinking about it, it's like we have to, we have to study a little bit to be able to get to understand things, right? So, but we can't get so caught up in the mind. We use both. We use the mind and the heart. So the conscious mind is what you're focused on right now. So you could be in this room, in the class, and your conscious mind could be focusing on some other problem. Which means what? Are you really here? Are you really in the now? Heck no, you're not, because you're somewhere else. And the thing about the subconscious mind, when there's tapes in there, you're never ever present, unless you're in a meditative state. Because even if you're here, you're not 100% here, because you're filtering through your subconscious mind. You're like, oh, he is full of crap there. You know what I mean? So, so, <laughs> so we tend to be, we tend to hardly ever, ever, ever be fully present. And the whole thing about a Buddha, or somebody like Christ, is somebody that is so embodied and centered within themselves, that they're, they're there. There, there's no separation. So, and that's, that's what we're working with right now, is, is finding our center. When you are learning a new task, like driving a car, your conscious mind is brought into the moment. Uh, wherever your thinking is, your conscious mind is. So when we're learning, remember when you're trying to drive a, drive a car, and you're like, during, in driving class, you're like, everybody's paying attention, all, you're, you know, your, your hands are at, what, 10 and 2? So you're, everybody's doing the right thing, and you can't have the radio on because that's too distracting. So you're doing everything right, and, uh, but once you get the hang of it, you know, you could be driving with one hand, talking on the cell phone, eating some nachos, and then, you know, hitting your children in the back because they're, right, they're arguing, right? And the reason that works is because your conscious mind has strained you so well that you can operate that. It's so ingrained within you that your unconscious mind can now do what your conscious mind did. That is one benefit of the unconscious mind, is it's like a function key on a computer. I can program it to do 10 things, hit one button, and it's done, as it's supposed to me trying to do it all. The downside to that is the subconscious mind is not controllable. Who here has ever been like, okay, I'm gonna go to the store, and you plan on driving to the store, and then you're, you're thinking about something, you're not in the moment, and you go past where you went to do, maybe, you, you, maybe like an automotive, automated robot, you drive home. But you said, I'm going to stop by Walmart on the way home to pick up this, right? Has anybody ever done that? Everybody typically has done that because what that means is your conscious mind was not there driving, right? Do you remember? Do you, like, when, your con when your subconscious mind is in charge, it's like you turned here, you, you, know, you, you weren't even aware that you did all that, but it was all automatic, which is scary because what that means is like being asleep at the wheel, literally. So your, your, conscious, your subconscious mind is then in control of what you experience. Just like if, you're at a, if you've gone to an interview, a job interview, and you're consciously there, and you're going to be interviewed, um, but then you start getting freaked out and scared, then your subconscious mind takes over, and this is where all the tapes are, like I'll never have enough, my, you know, I'm never accepted, or you know, that starts controlling the environment, not the conscious mind. So we're always fluctuating, and we're most of the time in the subconscious mind. Um, because our conscious mind will take us right out of the moment. So the subconscious mind is that part of you that does things for you without you having to think about it. That's, that's what the unconscious mind was made for. The downside is that we have a bunch of negative tapes in there that are running 24-7. <clears throat> Remember how nervous, and I've already gone over this, but I'll say it again. Remember how nervous you were when you first learned how to drive a car? You couldn't take your both hands off the wheel, and the radio broke your concentration. After you had been driving for a while, the subconscious mind knows the task enough that it can drive for you while you eat a burrito, talk on the phone, listen to the kids in the back seat. So the question is, who's the boss? The conscious and subconscious part of your mind are always going. However, only one of them can be dominant at any given time. So just like the left and right brain, the left brain being more masculine, the right brain, brain being more feminine, you're, if you're in your left brain, which we mostly are because we're, we're analyzing things, the right brain just doesn't turn off completely, okay? It's like the yin and the yang symbol, okay? Remember, yin and yang is not solid. 
Here you have the feminine. It's the night sky with the moon. Just like when, at night when we go to sleep, it's like going back into the womb. We like slide back into the womb as we slide back into bed. In the, in the daytime, the sun comes out and it's bright and we go out into the world. So we enact the whole yin, yang, yin, yang, your heart, yin, yang, yin, the seasons. So in wintertime, here's the tree. In the wintertime, the essence retreats from the tree. The tree's still there, but the leaves fall. The essence goes back into Mother Earth and then in summer it comes back out and things leave again. It's the, ching, it's the, the yin and the yang, the yin and the yang. So we're always going back and forth with this yin and yang consciousness. Um, <clears throat> but at any given time, it's not, just, it's not just feminine and it's not just masculine. There's always some part there. So if I'm in my left brain, there's still a, a little part of the right brain still going, thank God. Or <laughs> we'd be walking around some of the times like just brainless robots. And sometimes that can happen if it's a real split there. But there's always something going on. There's, there, there's always something within the other. It doesn't just go off completely. So when you're, when you're in your spiritual mind, there's, there's always some kind of aspect of the intellectual mind. Ideally, they're both balanced. So you actually get to consciously experience God, not just dream about it. <clears throat> Asleep at the will. When the conscious mind is caught up in thinking of the past or future, the subconscious mind takes over the show. The problem with this is that um, your perceived truths are in the subconscious mind, playing 24-7. So it's like a tape that's going, uh, I'm no good, I'm a failure. You know, you know how affirmations are, I'm wealthy, I'm wise. You know, you can do a conscious affirmation, but typically when we're doing an affirmation, how many times a day do you say it? Not as many times. You know, this, this, <laughs> we'll, give it a generous, we'll give it a generous number. Let's say you say, I'm... I'm uh, healthy and happy 30 times a day. Well, that subconscious program is going 24-7 all the time. When you're sleeping, when you're unconscious, that's still going. So sometimes when we say affirmation, affirmations, it's like sleep is, uh, shooting a BB gun at Godzilla. You know, it's going to take a long time for that affirmation to kill all the energy behind that. That's why affirmations can be so slow before you see a change. And people sometimes give up on the affirmation before the change happens because of that. Um, the analogy there is like, um, for me, would be like David and Goliath. It's like that if you're really, really conscious and you're really, really focused with your mind and what you want to do, it takes one shot and you can kill that huge giant. But you have to have the consciousness there to be able to do that. And that's what we're developing in our, on our quote-unquote spiritual path. This means that whatever task you find yourself in the middle of, um, the middle of, are filtering, you are filtering it through your tapes. For example, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve this, I shouldn't do that because my mom won't like it. The tapes that play are related to resonance factors. So resonance factor is uh, money issues are going to be related to anything that relates to money, right? So if you get a bill in the mail and you're thinking that, um, life is just a big work from cradle to grave, you're helping feeding all the negativity around the money. This gives you a little uh, help in uncovering the source of tapes so that you can erase them. The cool thing about this is that when you've got a negative experience in the conscious, the reality world, it's a mirror of what? What's in the subconscious. So if you know what the language is, and that's what we've been studying for so long, if you know what the language of things is, then you can say, ah, oh, that's pointing to that thing. That thing right there is causing this to show up. So like shoulder pain. Shoulder pain is like Atlas holding up the world. It's responsibility. So if I've got this, I'm seeing this aspect in the world of being, so, I got, so my right shoulder is like the tip of the iceberg, okay? The real problem below that is I have this perception that the life I'm in right now is a burden. And whether it's true or not, the physical pain will be there, okay? Now if you look, if you can change that perception and go, okay, I'm going through this, but I'm growing strong from the experience, the shoulder pain won't be there. It's the negative programs that get us, our negative, our negative filters. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Turn to the next page. This is page uh, 46. And this puts the, 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 the picture of the, the consciousness of the mind a little bit better. I did leave this one closed, but really it's an open loop. So the conscious mind, um, this makes up about 10%. You know how they say that humans use about 10% of their brain? That's that conscious, that's what we're aware of. It's the unconsciousness that sinks our ships, not what we're conscious of. Because if we're aware of it, we tend to be somewhat working on it. 
Not always. I mean, we can know something, but it doesn't mean we're working on it. But the conscious mind, at least we tend to be aware of something. It's what's underneath that, what's unconscious that really gets us. Because those are the things that are most, the most deadly to our spiritual growth, our physical body, our relationships, and our reality in general, or what's underneath all the, all the junk. So the conscious mind, though this makes up 10% of the total mind, um, we give it credence uh, or credit for the bulk of our understanding. That's only 10% of who we are. I mean, think about it. In any particular, the things I, that I put together, like these courses and other things, are my learning and my helping other people to expand past their 10% awareness of things. Because if you know what different things in the body mean and how that's showing up in your reality, it makes you more conscious. You're using more of your brain if you can start seeing the world in an expanded way. Um, but you still have to be consciously working through and for that. Um, so, but it's still not all that powerful. Consciousness has to be expanded or it doesn't give you the whole picture. The subconscious mind is unresolved experiences reside here. So things in childhood that you could not rationalize or work through, they get, they get shoved into the basement. You can think about the subconscious being the basement. The worst part of our mind is what they call the sub-subconscious mind. It's like a basement within the basement. And what happens is in that space, we take, through our lifetime, we've had lots of negative experiences. Let's say we had five different negative experiences that weren't related, but they had some similar thing to them. We can mix those together and make some hybrid of something that relates to reality zero amount. Those hybrids are the worst things. So this is like our very warped perceptions of reality. And it's not just individually, it's like I mean, there's collective warped perceptions of reality too. Like the whole concept that uh, war can somehow create peace is insanity. Because the whole concept of war is not peace. You know. Um, our super, our sub super is our conscience. It, uh, it seeks answers to our questions with the super and delivers answers to the conscious mind. So when we're in this space here, we're closer to this connection. But the problem is we still got to transcend through all this junk to get the message back. Okay? In truth, remember, in truth, there's just one mind. And there's no way to completely compartmentalize this. This is just like a big orb of energy. And to be completely honest, the whole body is the mind, okay? Just like Bruce Lipton uh, has brought out about cell biology, it's the cell's membrane that is the brain. Even look at the word membrane, it's mem-brain, it's memory brain. The cell, the entire body is memory brain. Inside your gut is neuropeptides. That means brain tissue. Does it, the enteric nervous system, which is um, your, your intestines basically, is called the second brain. It's nervous tissue. And what happens is if you fold the body at the heart, this brain comes to this brain. It's one whole thing. It's, it's like in, in utero how we split from the heart. So actually reality is, is seeing the world with a split heart. And if you can start unifying that, things start to change. It's like children and people that have ADD, Asperger, their diet hugely affects their brain. Like you can help children that are Asperger or ADD, ADHD by changing their diet because the intestines are swollen and irritated, which means this brain is swollen and irritated. <coughs> you change the diet here, you change the chemistry up here. 90% of your serotonin is produced here. 90% of your serotonin, which is like the bliss hormone, is here, not here. <coughs> um, and another way of looking at this is like, this is like the mind-body, and this is like the soul-self. But really, it's one thing, right? There's no separation at all. Uh, I think I've covered all that. Page 47. I'm not going to go over this one completely because it's pretty much a um, rehash of what we just covered. It covers it a little bit differently. Let me see something real quick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess I'll kind of skim through this pretty quickly. So this is just another representation here. You see the uh, turquoise arrow going down and the, the fuchsia kind of arrow going up, the green and the pink. So that's like our conscious mind sending like a request down and then the pink sending information back up. You see how it's filtered through the subconsciouses, right? So the conscious mind is your learned intellectual concepts and opinions. It's, it's whatever you put in here. So the left brain is like this huge, vast building, okay, here with all thousands of uh, filing cabinets. 
you learn math. You put that in that filing cabinet. Um, you learn this spiritual concept. You, you, you were raised Baptist. You were raised Catholic. All this information is put in here in the left brain. Okay? Um, and it's what you've learned through the external world. Getting answers, um, like I need to solve this, if we're preoccupied with the consciousness, um, we tend to miss the, miss the boat. We, gotta have, we, have to have, we have to have the feminine brain and the conscious brain going together. And uh, just like Marita talked about, if you're so in your mind and you're trying to solve the problem, it's like being in this filing cabinet and like looking for something. It's like, I can't find it. And you start getting more frantic and frantic. But you know that concept of just sleeping on it? When you can just let your mind turn off, like with meditation, it's when this part of the brain goes, oh, and the light coming from up, up above, so to speak, shines on the different filing cabinets that you need to go to and get. You, the mind, this part of your mind cannot solve the problem by itself. It's like saying that if only men were on the planet, it would survive and thrive. So what would happen, though, in about 40 years? There would be nobody else because there would be no females to repopulate the place, right? And the same way with females. That, that doesn't work either. Matriarchal and patriarchal by themselves do not work. There's got to be a blend. And that blend is our journey to the heart. Because the lower three chakras are what? Male. Male. Masculine. It's about survival, sexuality, and power. Man. The upper three chakras are feminine, right? Communication. They're more intuitive. And they have a God understanding, which to me is like seeing more. Men tend to be like focus, like in the, like the, the symbol for Mars. In, uh, which is a circle and the arrow going off, like the erection. It's like men can only focus on one thing at a time. Okay? Where females can, you know, they can be ironing in the kitchen and cooking something, and then they're like, hmm, spidey sense, you know, go in the other room. Yeah, go, yeah. Go, go in the other room. Yeah, go in the other room, and Billy's like about to dis dissect the dog, you know. So the females have that spatial expansion. And usually when guys show up in this group, they have that too. There's more of a blend of male and female if guys show up here. And it's not the typical guy consciousness. You have more feminine within you. It means that you have more of, a, more of the balance, right? Average guy on the streets is going to be like this. Too feminine is just as bad as that. I do not like to be around somebody extremely feminine. It feels very draining. And, mm, you know? and, I, and I typically don't like to be around somebody that's strictly masculine. I can handle it. But it's not the energy I thrive around. I thrive around people that are more like this. And those are the people that show up here because they wouldn't be here if they didn't have a feminine concept of spirituality. They wouldn't, just wouldn't, they wouldn't be here. Or they wouldn't be here very long. We put it that way. <laughs> they would come and go, whoa, that guy's like crazy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's weird. Um, subconscious. Um, this is the repository of habits, patterns, and turbulent memories. Deep memories and stored emotion. The subs are the final obstacle to realization. Whatever's in your unconscious mind means if there's something in your unconscious mind, you cannot be what? Fully what? Aware. Fully conscious aware. Okay? That's what we're doing when we're tapping. We're tapping into those dark spots. And I'm working on myself. It's not like I'm completely there too. So when, when I get worked on, I'm working to see where I'm blind to. So we're all walking around like this to some degree. And the more we work, whether it's tapping, whether it's meditation, whether it's qigong, chai chi, I don't give a hell what it is, it's opening up your perception. But it's never done. You're always trying to expand this. It's not like you, you know, that's why I say enlightenment is not the end stage. That's a misperception. You have to be conscious or halfway enlightened that you have a problem to start to work with it, right? It's like the alcoholic program. You know, they first get to say, Hi, I'm Bill and I'm an alcoholic. That's consciously acknowledging the problem, but they still have to do the work, right? It's not just like, Oh, I have this problem. It's solved now. No, you have to do the work. Um, the subconscious mind uh, wrapped up in charged emotion, memories that have pushed deep into deep down to keep them away from the conscious scrutiny. So these are things that we were unable to process, so we shove them down because we don't want to look at them. They're nasty and they're ugly. Um, this movie is coming to mind. You know how movies always speak to me and give me information. Uh, what is the name of that movie? John... Uh, Being John Malkovich? No, no, no. 
That was a bizarre movie. God, <laughs> this is pretty. Uh, no, no, the actor, um, John. I want to say John Candy, but it's not John Candy. Uh, he, no, he played in. Um, I didn't see this movie, but I, I, in Hot Tub, Hot Tub, Time, Time Warp, Hot, hot John Tub. John Cusack. John Cusack. Oh. Okay, John Cusack is the main character in this movie, and it's um, it's about a multiple personality person. Is it anybody got the name yet? It's, it's um, gosh, I want to say simplicity. Mm. I'm, it's a it's 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 a very it's a it's a very powerful movie. It's a one word title, right? Yeah, it's a one word title. It's about this patient that has multiple person. Like beautiful mind, but that's no, 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 no. It's um, it's it's a it's a it's a movie about a guy that has a multiple personality, and multiple personality works because what happens is, you know, you could say that art movie went over we went over perception and consciousness last week, but we it's like we view the world through a sheet of glass, okay, and little bitty things that happen to us are like scratches on the glass, so we begin to get muck our our window. We cannot see reality clearly. We cannot see one another clearly, right? Because we're projecting. We're not just seeing something. You know, um, females are this way. So when I see a female, I'm projecting on, and I prevent me from being. So we got all these scratches on. But if we've had hard trauma, it's like somebody's come along and hit that glass so hard that it's actually cracked. Okay? Those are really deep seated things that aren't just about scrubbing it off, it's about really going in there deeply and healing that from, from the inside out. However, if a trauma is so, so deep, and if it is prolonged experience over time, it's like hammer, hammer. Hammer. So here, something hit it in a crack like your windshield. But imagine, this is what multiple personality is. Or let me go back to single personality. We all have all these mucks on our things and these deep cracks, right? These deep things that prevent us from seeing reality. But the glass is still one piece, right? This is what happens. This is what creates a multiple personality. That trauma is so deep and that's pounded on over and over that, that the thing that holds it all together, even though we have our separate pieces, right? We can still know it's me. But if there's deep trauma, that glass shatters and falls into lots of pieces. So when somebody, when a multiple personality, they pick up one piece and they look through it and they think they're that piece. Then another piece, they're, they're, they're separated. But in a way, we're all schizophrenic. Thank God, though, we have some veil that makes us hold us together. But we all have different aspects. When we're around our dad, we act this way. When we're around our lover, we act this way. So we have all these different perceptions we act from, but we still know that we're one person. A multiple personality is that have been so fractured and so damaged that they are unaware that they're still one person. I and mean, that's a lot of deep work to go into. But still, we're all shattered within. The sub-sub is very deep programming experience, uh, experiences which make hybrids. Um, so these are the things that attract... Because um, what happens is the sub-sub, unless you're working on a spiritual level to try to get into here and working on your conscious things, the sub-sub is what causes in your reality, quote-unquote, accidents. Okay? It's the things that causes a car accident. Okay? And in my opinion, there are no accidents. So, uh, especially time frames and everything, things are so really funny in a way. Um, like I went to visit my mom this weekend, and uh, she worked for a photographer in Dallas, and um, she has always had this picture um, of Kennedy one hour before he was shot and killed. She's kept it, and she gave it to me this time, which well, that was pretty cool, but I didn't like put too much stock into it. But I visited one of my friends that I uh, first met when I was in massage school 16 years ago, and we've been friends ever since, and she was in, the, in uh, Osho's uh, commune years ago and everything. So... We have this real deep spiritual connection. So I visited her down there, and she was talking about somebody that um, she was interested in seeing. So I was just clicking on YouTube's because we were looking on our computer, and <laughs> this lady's interviewing this guy, and she said, "So, uh, and it's the same guy, Ram Das. It's a buddy of Ram Das's. Uh, there's Krishna Das, which is a singer. This is uh, I forget his name, so I, I can't even tell you. And then Ram Das. These three guys, like a trinity, we all went over to India at the same time and I had this." And um, they, made, they had these spiritual experiences. Anyway, I'm like looking at these YouTubes because I want to know a little bit more. And the, there's a lady doing an interview with him. And she goes, so how long after Kennedy's assassination did you go to India? And all that was was it's like seemingly little bitty things set in your path to make you pay attention. Because if, if, if my mom had not given me that picture that I'd known was there forever, I wouldn't have paid like, whoa, I need to be paying attention to this. You know what I'm saying? Because that little bitty echo was like, hey, 
And how in the hell would that happen? So, and that happened within like four hours because she gave it to me before I left. I wasn't to visit my friend. I'm the one picking the YouTubes and that shows up. That's how crazy reality is in reflecting things. But you've got to be conscious to catch it. You have to be conscious to catch it because God is screaming at us. And we're walking around like we're not, we can't hear Him. Or her, it, whatever. I don't want to label it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, what happens is, in the sub-sub, you create the accidents because you need something like that to jar that consciousness to reality. So, if you have a car wreck and you break this shoulder, it's going to show you there's something really, really strong in your consciousness related to what? What's the right shoulder? Support male. Male. The, the, no, the left side is female. It's also support. All these other little bitty things. So, it's trying to, bring your, it's trying to wake you up to something. So it's like God slapping you when, when something really strong happens in your life. And we can call those accidents, and we can call them like God is punishing you. God doesn't punish us. It's our consciousness that is guiding reality, just like in the movie The Secret. We are guiding it 24-7. We tend to only look at the positive things, and, oh, my life is so synchronistic right now. Guess what? Your life is synchronistic 24-7. Even the negative stuff in your life is synchronistic with your thoughts. If you think anything differently, you're asleep. Synchronicity is happening 24-7, not just when good things happen. When good things happen, it means you're starting to be conscious and work with it. But remember, this whole thing is your consciousness, not just here. When you were when talking about uh, the real decisions, you kind of forget about consciousness. Uh, it's almost like when you are you say, I knew this is what happened, like you break something. Yeah. By the same time, you're reaffirming that, say, uh, that negative. Exactly. So it comes back again and again. And yeah, and we get in those silly little loops. It's like that tape that keeps, it's like, shut up! <laughs> you know? I get sick this time every year. Yeah, yeah. That's a big um, one. Oh, and like Tracy, you talked about... <laughs> no, but Tracy, you talked about your friend. My friend. When you, she when, stocks up on tissues because she knows she's going to get sick. Hey, but so she, she but has she, like 18 boxes of tissues. But, but there, there's all kinds of different tissues, too. <laughs> yes. So it's, like, so it's like that It's like that box of tissues, an affirmation. It's an affirmation saying, I'm going to get sick. Yeah, so what would she have to do to start changing the pattern? Get rid of the tissue. Yeah. Stop yeah. buying into it. Get it. Buying right. into it. Sam's it. would make a lot of money if she was <laughs> yeah. buying tissues. So, so by the freaking case. It's like, whatever we put our money into is our consciousness, sub and consciously, is what we're buying into. It's what we're drawing to us. So, uh, you know, I used to be a big horror buff guy, and it got to where I could not watch him because I started drawing. You know, the more, you're, more, more of this that expands, the more power you get in touch with. So I started creating some weird, weird experiences. And I was like, it doesn't pay to do that. I'm not going to invest my time, my money, and my energy in something that's going to bing back negative. Um, and it's like investing in the wrong thing. And it's taking energy away as opposed to getting... But the thing about that is we're all doing that on some level. Because of the, un the unconscious things, we're, we're buying into them. You know, we're, we're doing it, but, we know that, but the spiritual path is to be more and more aware. And the, the more you see one thing, it's like being in a dark room. This is the enlightenment thing. So you're in a dark room, and in order to see something, how do you see something in a dark room? What's the one thing you need to see something? Light. light okay? So, but let's say this person has like a, a match. You didn't, know, you didn't even know where the light switch is, right? The light switch is like full enlightenment. So you've got to start somewhere. So it's like he's looking around, he find some matches and he lights a match. So that match is going to give you so much awareness if this room was black, right? It's only going to light up so much. But the more aware you get, it's like then you have a flashlight and then you have like a big light. Eventually you find out where the, the light switch is, you hit that, that's full enlightenment. That's fully aware. So we're on the process of that. So we may have light in here and we can direct it on different things at one time, but only until we can light up everything at once can we see all the interconnections. Because things... And the more I do that, the more interconnection I see. Just like the whole thing with the, um, the Kennedy thing. Somebody might just say, that's just, that's, that, that was just a coincidence. I freaking know it's a lot more than a coincidence. Yeah, and synchronicity takes away the concept of coincidences. So if I looked at it that way, it wouldn't have such a deep impact. But we're having that 24-7. That's what you've got to get, is that everything is synchronistic. That negative relationship, it's synchronistic with something in here. If you're not consciously aware of it, you better start digging in here because that negative thing is going to be there until you get rid of that. Because that's just the way reality works. 
And that's the real deep spiritual work. Not just going around, gazing at my navel, meditating, chanting, and play, you know, getting tarot card readings. That's not going to get you here. Okay? You've got to be willing to go deep. So the superconscious mind is the essential you. It is not something you become, it is you, and is revealed as the covering layers of ignorance are removed. So as these un these so what happens eventually is all of a sudden when you really clear out the subs, this becomes one whole unit, which is always has been. There's nothing secret from you within you, and what happens is the world reflects the same thing. It's like you become so conscious, you can see what's going on with somebody like that. Or you can see what's going on in the world. You make sense. Like the whole thing about the world right now is all the turmoil that's happening is we've had a spiritual flip. And the, the thing is, it's like a hologram. Well, it's not, it is, it is not like, it is a hologram. I'm totally convinced of that now. So here's the globe, okay? There's the left side. Left side is masculine thinking, analytical, right? Then we have the feminine side, the right side, okay? That's the globe. On the east, it was all spiritually focused. On the West, over here, we were male focused. We were developing technology, using our mind, getting money, money. Oh, on the spiritual side, they were getting rid of all their material. They lived in poverty, right? But that's still unbalanced. It had to flip. Now all the spirituality is like flooding over to the West, and now all the cell phones and shit are going over there, right? So, so and, it, and you go look at it, like, oh my God. I mean, it's like messing up that side. Well, there has to be a balance, though, because spirituality is not about living in poverty. That's insanity. I want the people that are spiritually aware to have the money and control the world. I don't want the idiots that are asleep and in their masculine mind trying to separate and control people in charge. And that's what's going on right now. It had to flip. We have to wake up. It's not, it's we the people, right? We have to do it as a whole. I think I've covered, any questions on it? I think I covered that pretty good. So we're limited as far as the information we get back based on what's in here. So when we dream, realize that your dreams are encoded information. Okay, we make up that we make up what comes back through here. Because for me, an apple might be uh, um, putting somebody to sleep, where somebody might think an apple is delicious, right? So the, all these symbolisms are going to be very specific to you. So your dreams are trying to give you messages from spirit, but you're interpreting them based on your filters. It's like a movie I saw recently. Um, it's about, true. I learned quite a bit about Freud and Jung. Um, what is it called? A Dangerous Method. Anybody seen that movie? It's about Freud and Jung. I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty accurate movie. Um, but it's pretty interesting how they talk about the different aspects. And Jung went on to bring, bring astrology into understanding the mind and body. I mean, Jung really went way out there. And Freud and him kind of argued over that because uh, Freud was all about the sexual perversion aspect of that. Um, which, which is one level to get stuck in. Of course, there's unconscious like that. But during that, they're interpreting a lot of dreams. And it shows you exactly the information that's coming through. So every dream is an information from God. Think about it that way. And if you can take that and try to interpret it, then you can get the direct information. The clearer you get, the less cryptic the information. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have a direct, if you have a direct connection, you don't need to be have all the encrypted information. It just comes to you. And not just in your dreams, but in your reality. You know, I got that Kennedy picture, and then I got that. It's like, pay attention to what's going on now, because it is super important. If you don't pay attention to this right now, that's tied to that, because you had a double whammy. If you miss this, you miss what's really going on, the bigger picture. So, let's go to the next page. No questions there? Sorry, I'm going to get him in my evangelistic voice tonight. <laughs> um, and the Lord said, hey, Yeah. That's one of my favorite songs. Um, something weird happened to my computer. And I'm trying to sort through it, so I don't have this song to play, or I would play it. Uh, plus, I'm recording this for YouTube, so if I, if I record it, I'd have to kill it out of the thing. But, again, reflectives, to me, are everywhere. In music, I get reflectives. In movies, I call them reflectives from the collective, because no, a book somebody's writing, a movie somebody's making... They're pl everybody's plugged into the collective. And we're, if, you, if you're really open and aware, you get information from everywhere all the time. Okay? What's really interesting to me, what's coming through in the movies, what's like one of the biggest, excuse me, what's one of the biggest themes in movies right now? Huh? Zombies. Superheroes. Superheroes is what I'm looking for. It's like, it's like, yeah, the, yeah there's, there's, a double, there's a double thing going on. 
Just like you know, Thursday they talked about the um, the real act. There's like been six instances where yeah. people actually ate somebody else's face off, and this is on camera. It's uh, not in camera, camera, but happened in California and Florida. There's this new drug. What's the drug called? Yeah. yeah, and it's making people turning into the zombies, literally. So there's an, there's that theme going on, which I'm not going to focus on. But then there's the other theme of um, superheroes, which superheroes are about abilities that are inborn into us that we're unlocking, right? And even within superhero stories, they all have different themes. In Spider-Man, it was always something that was altered through technology. Every one, every one of Spider-Man's things are technology. Batman's issues are always going to be about something twisted in the mind. Which is interesting, what do they call the newer movies? Ba Batman is what? The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight of the Soul. That's what it's about, right? That's the reflective and the collective. And he wears all bat, black and he's a bat, right? And then Iron Man. Iron Man gets damaged in his heart. Okay? And they build this freaking <laughs> small little blue toroidal field. Okay? And they put it in his heart as the, as the motor. Okay? Then he also has places in his hands. That's the hand chakra. It's also where Christ was wounded. Okay? And then he's got it on his feet, which is our K1 kidney meridian connection to earth. The green lantern. Um, I went through a phase of getting rid of my, all my toys, so um, I, had, I, I was going through a purge period. Anyway, the green, I, had, I had little toys up here to show, but the Green Lantern, the Green Lantern, where's his ring on the middle finger? Middle finger is what meridian? <coughs> Pericardium. It's the sac that surrounds the heart. Green is what, is what uh, chakra is green associated with? Heart. heart. Okay. And on his heart, the symbol that he had was a circle with a line and a line. If you add one single line down the center, it's pi. It's the Fibonacci sequence. Here we have a superhero that's green, heart, pericardium, heart, and he was using his will through his heart to control things, and it goes back to the Fibonacci pi sequence, which is all everything about reality. Doing this right here, this whole thing right here is pi. That little sequence mathematically becomes that sequence, becomes that sequence, becomes that sequence. My hand. Uh, fits so many times into my body, my foot fits perfectly between there. That's the Fibonacci sequence. A plant as it grows, it goes here, mathematical, boom, mathematical, the leaves. It's all good. So it's really cool how it just overlays and overlays to the point that it's like crazy. And the cool thing about that, of course, I, at some point I thought I was crazy, but that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's my cut. I'm no longer using 10% of my brain. I'm using a lot more than 10% of my brain. And when I see a movie, when I read a book, or I see something, I experience life, I'm beginning to see, it's not like my room is completely full, but I'm seeing so many different objects now that I go, oh man, that relates to that and that and that. And then as I do more and more of that, then boom, something else lights up. Then boom, something else lights up. And to the point where I'm so conscious that I see no separation between everything, and that every little thing I see is so connected, it's like, holy crap. I mean. It gets, it gets so full of it. I mean, like, I'm going to chill now. Um, and the more aware that you become, it just, gets, it just starts getting broader and broader. What you can perceive and what you're understanding. And you can see how the past of not only your life, but the past of the people that you're tied to, tie into exactly where you are and how that ties into the future and how you can change that. And you know, it's, it's crazy. Anyway, well, I got off on a tangent there, but... Um, <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil, and I love this song. You know what line I, I centered on first off? Who killed the Kennedys? <laughs> oh my God! That is crazy! Oh, I love it! I totally <laughs> forgot about that! <laughs> Did I? It's right in the middle of the song. In the very middle of the Oh my God, that is, see? That's my number three! <laughs> and I didn't highlight that one either at the time. That is crazy. Okay, now, now you also know that my, my fascination with the brain, right? And that, that this right here, the sphenoid bone, which is this bone right in here, which is in the center of your head, is the Ark of the Covenant. That's why I painted it gold, okay? Even in anatomy, this is called the greater wings, and these are called the lesser wings. The cherubs, which are on top of the Ark of the Covenant, they, their wings touch the outer. It's actually the verse that says that. And what happens is this little cradle in here. Um, can I forget the name right now? So I'm all jazzed up. Uh, the, the pituitary sits right down in that cradle. The pituitary is your third eye, which controls all the hormones of your body. So whatever hormones your pituitary excretes makes 
since every every endocrine is associated with a chakra, whatever this tells you to do, that tells you how your chakras are open or closed, right? Okay. So, and this looks like an owl to me. Totally, you know, they say it looks like a, a butterfly, That's but nice. it's a horned owl. Look, you see the little horns here and then the nose? It's like a, and it's got even got like little eyes. It looks like a horned owl to me. So that even brought another layer, layer to this song because one of the parts of the song is hoo, 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 and it keeps repeating hoo, hoo. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about an owl, not just hoo, hoo. So that's why I brought that in. My, my thing tonight. But um, what you really think about this song is I highlighted the things that really stand out to me. I've been around for a long, long time. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. Now, I'm not saying the devil is separate. The devil are the concepts within us that separate ourselves. And all the devils, right there is where they live. Okay? So this whole thing about... Um, I've been around for a long, long time. Since you've been born, those things have been inside of you. The devil's not separate. The devil's inside of you. We act beastly when our mind is split, right? The whole job of spirituality is singulating your focus to its one eye, one mind, one body, one heart. That's when you're connected to God. And to the degree that you've done that is how d disconnected you are. The whole song is really powerful, but... Again, what, but what's confusing you is the nature of my game. So this whole devil concept confuses us. It keeps us from being in our spiritual nature. I'm in need of restraint. So it's like saying we're supposed to be in there consciously working to restrain it. But what's put, I said that again. It's the nature of my game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell you one more time, you're to blame. That's funny. The last line there is you're to blame, right? So here it is talking about the devil. But then it's the very bottom. It says, I tell you one time, it's you, it, you're to blame. Anyway, to me, that's really powerful. And that's crazy. That is so good that you pointed out to me, Marshall, about the Kennedy thing. That is cool. Um, anyway, I'm sharing that. I would play the song, but I'm sharing that to me because this is like one of those reflectives. And it's even more powerful to me because the Kennedy thing in there today, anyway. So there's always layers of information coming at us all the time. So when they made this song up, there's information to be collected from that that go deeper than the lyrics, right? Deeper than they even probably knew because they're pulling stuff out of this thing here, right? And they're making it up. And unless they're completely conscious, it's like they get the idea, but they may not know exactly what it's all attached to. You know what I mean? That's like when we do things. We, might know, may, we may not know exactly what it all is attached to, but we do it because we're drawn to. The cool thing is the more aware you become, you get to play, you get to play the big game. You get to become aware <laughs> why you're doing it and how it's going to affect everything. So the next page here... So the, the, the last line that you were talking about is more about the taking responsibility. Yeah, so it's, it's here's like saying, you know, pl pleased to meet you, I hope you guess my name. Um, it's the devil singing the song, mm -hmm. and then right at the very end, the devil says, I tell you, one time, you're to blame. So Not so I'm to blame, take, take you're to blame, yeah. <laughs> take self-responsibility. Right. Yeah. Um, just like when it goes through all the negative stuff, like uh, I was around when the Blitzkrieg hit, uh, I forget, oh, uh, when the blitzkrieg raged and the bodies stank, pleased to meet you. I hope you guessed. So he's talking about all these negative things that happened during war, right? But it was humans that did that. Humans that were in the split, polarized mind that did that. And the demons are inside of us, not outside of us. And I don't care what you try to purge in reality and make that perfect. It's never going to be that way until we do it here. We have to purge these little demons out of us. And, look, and I like to look at the demons as demands. The more they demand from us, the more screwed up world the, the reality is. So here's just my perception here of a little, people say this is like the demon cat, but. Yeah. It, <laughs> so this is demons. De demons equal mental demands. Now I made this big, and unless you had a picture, it's a little harder to see. It's like this huge little, um, it's, a, it's like an energy body, okay? I, try to, I give it a shape, but let's just say it's a field of thought. And it's tied to people down here. There's like little streamers going down and tying into the minds of people, okay? And this is like a blow up of that. So it's like, so this little here, this here, this little circle here is like a blow up of a leg, right? So it's like reaching down into your conscious mind, into your subconscious and sub, and controlling you, okay? That little de demon is controlling you. Not from the outside, from the inside. Um, it goes two ways. Let me, let me put a little clause in there is all of reality is about consciousness. We're creating it, and we're experiencing it, and reacting to other people, and we're all playing with consciousness, okay? 
Once somebody has a negative belief and gives it enough power, it's like it's all around the world. Okay? And we can plug into we plug into that by having certain similar thoughts within ourselves. Okay? If I let's say if I'm KKK, I, I, I was raised in that real religious uh, environment. I'm connected to everybody else that thinks that same way around the planet, right? Seriously. And that goes for any thought that you have. And that goes right with the whole concept of a hundredth monkey theory, critical mass. Once that monkey's on the, you know, it's a, the hundredth monkey theory is about the monkeys that go, they get sweet potatoes every day on this island, and one p monkey starts washing its sweet potato. And then what happens is one monkey sees that monkey, and it starts washing its sweet potato, and on and on. And it, there's not an exact number, but as soon as the hundredth monkey washed its sweet potato, and there was more monkeys on that island. Every monkey on that island all of a sudden knew to wash. Not just like I saw it, but they knew. It's like critical mass is another word for that. Every monkey on that island then knew to wash its potato. And the crazy thing that goes beyond that is that species of monkey not only in the island knew that instant, but all over the planet, which had no contact. That's called critical mass. So enough people think of the same way, that's when things jump. Because reality doesn't just change real slowly. When there's enough people, there's a quantum leap. There's a quantum change, and 2012 is supposed to be one of those changes where we have a quantum leap, where we're about to make a change, where we won't even recognize ourselves from where we came from. Um, Not, huh? It's happening to dung beetles right now, big time. Yeah, lots of little weird things are changing. What, um, this is the year of the dragon, not, is the year of change. little pushers anymore, they're getting very radical and hostile. And then There's other things. They're just pushing down. They're not just pushing food things so that could be a reflective too yeah. oh yeah totally <laughs> becoming more hostile and um i'm tired of this shit yeah <laughs> um so we have the, so look at this little demon as something being like a collective thought field okay and it can only attach to you if you have a similar resonant thinking okay and this goes back to the whole another again a collective reflective of like uh, a vampire which is funny somebody bam me about vampires right in the old old story of vampires they could only come into your house if what invited. you invited them right so you we have to invite the demon in we have to have a similar thought process that aligns with that or they can't come in because if I didn't think that way, I would not be able to entertain that, right? If I didn't think a certain way, I would not be able to entertain that mental demand because it would not make sense to me. But if there's a resonance somehow through an experience or something that you inherited mentally from your, your family, then there's going to be a resonance there. So, um, and affirmations can start disconnecting you, but not completely. There's got to be a little more to happen. Does that make sense? That's a collective. Yeah. I don't know how you're talking about the money or Yeah, yeah. Well, it just has a, it's kind of like related to it, but... Uh -huh. Um, like I've been having like crazy awarenesses just differently. Yeah. And then um, yesterday, um, something I don't even remember what it was. Something came up, like something like meet up. And I was like, hmm, wonder what meet up is. Mm -hmm. Looked it up, and I ended up here. <laughs> and I was like, that's why I, it was really weird, just because of, of all the things that mm -hmm. they're. They, they all kind of like, connect. Yeah. yeah they all yeah. Up. So like, synchronicity. Yeah. Like you're here. Yeah, I, I wasn't like, oh, I want to. I yeah, you weren't trying. It just kind of. Yeah, yeah, it, it just seems random, but it winds up actually. It just kind of flows. Yeah. That's exactly, and that's a really great point that Mar Margarita brought up is when you're really connected, you know, this is, you know, how typical life is, is I want this to happen. So I'm going to push, push, push on reality and make it happen, right? When you're doing that, it tells you that you're disconnected because if you're connected, since it's all like this ocean, right, it flows. You start, it's like, it's, and it sounds like the Kennedy thing. I couldn't have even fathomed to try to make that happen. It just kind of flowed into it, which makes it really cool. If I had to force into it, it kind of takes away some of the fun of it. You know, it's like, okay, that, you know, the, when it flows, you actually get the feeling that you're in a relationship with something beyond just your own freaking mind, right? When it flows, you're like, wow, this is cool. I'm not just really interacting with myself. I'm really interacting with the whole thing. And it's like, if I have a thought, it's like it ripples out and it has its own interaction. The thing is that we're doing that 24-7, even with our negative thoughts. So if you get a negative thing come back, be aware that you're doing it too. Yeah. So let's go to the next page here. And I'm going to try to uh, bring this in a little bit more personal. So demons, these are negative mental patterns that feed off of you by demanding and directing your energy, which is your emotions and your actions. Um, demons come in many sizes. So we have the global size, 
the uh, Sam's size, <laughs> Sam's store. Um, the glo so they're different sizes. The, the global would be a collective thought, right? A lot of people believing one way. Okay, does that make sense? So um, racism, that's a global thought. It's, it's individual, but it's also global, unfortunately. So the global, and you can, this is like to, dis, this is like to uh, tell you which ones are which. Global. The types, they're social and regional, religious and educational also. They result in prejudice of groups and of people. The family type, these are smaller because family units tend to be smaller, right? And these have their own demons that get passed down through the lineage, right? And the family types are family top belief systems. So th th like a KKK could be a global and a family, you know what I mean? But it doesn't have to be because a child could be twisted off and become something different. The re they result in negative relationships and controlling behavior, okay? And then the personal one, these types, are the demons we create ourselves based on our experiences. Like our, our expectations of females are always, you know, um, uh, my mom always let me down. I expect females to um, always let me down. All females are bitches. That type of thing is a personal one. They result in self-doubt and self-loathing. Demons are parasitic. They feed off of each other. The global, the global, uh, the personal demands feed off the family demands, which feed off the global demons. So it's like this inner nested. It's like the whole Russian thing. They can all relate to keep going inside, inside, inside. Um, and going back to, um, I got sidetracked here, but going back to one of the collective reflectives, like in the stories of vampires and uh, werewolves, which they're parasites, right? They feed off of you. Vampires are feeding off your blood, and wolves are killing you to feed off you, right? Um, and it's a collective reflective there, because vampires feed off your blood, and you kill a vampire typically how? Wood. That's a werewolf. More. That's a werewolf. Garlic. Where, garlic. That's for, that just okay. for sun. Yeah. Garlic, sunlight. garlic, sun, or wood. Well, forget about the forget about the sunlight one. That's the. Yeah. That's the, that's the still the sun. Still yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, the so this. Vampire. Yeah, the traditional vampires. You pull them out of the dark, which is the ignorance. They never could be in light. Okay. So sun killed them. Sun is like going out into moving energy. Um, the uh, they were killed by wood and they were killed by garlic. So these are, these are parasites that come and feed off your blood. So does anybody know what, how you kill parasites that you actually get inside your body? Garlic. Garlic is one of the main things that kills them. Sunlight is one of the therapies. And uh, wormwood is one of the main things that kills them. Werewolves is another form of parasite. Silver bullets is the main way to cut them where you cut their head off. And colloidal silver is known to help with parasites too. It's basically a silver that you can drink inside. In the prairie days, they um, learned this. They would take a silver coin, which it was actually 100% back then, or close to it. And when they had milk and things, they would put the silver in, because there was no refrigerator, right? And when they were on these long wagon trains, they would put the silver coins into the milk, and it would keep it from going bad. It kept all these parasites and bacteria out. So again, it's a reflective, collective thing. It's all information coming back that's telling you something, a deeper story, a real deep story, that goes beyond what looks like it's on the surface. Now I'm going to show you how these lovely things work into your body. So, this is page 50. 50, you have, like say you have a religious thing. Uh, ancestors pushed, uh, punished, were punished for beliefs. Okay, let's say, um, the crazy thing about religion is, you know how um, certain religions, like say Baptist, can be pretty judgmental of somebody that maybe think a different way. They were, they were persecuted before too. It's like you think eventually people would stop Persifying or uh, persecuting other people because they've gone through it, right? But, you know, Christians were like tortured for their beliefs back during the Catholic Roman days. So, uh, ancestors, let's say there's this past ancestral lineage where some of your ancestors were, were punished for their religious beliefs. That passed through the family demon, which is belief systems passed on by the family, and these are taught to children and things like that. And the unconscious is we're not able to express our beliefs because when they did, they were killed before, right? And then what happens is this personal belief gets into your field and it's like, I'm not free to express my beliefs and feelings. And I made this very, very uh, specific because the demon is tying in to the throat chakra and the heart chakra. So the mental demand, uh, whether, it's a relig whether it's global, whether it's family or personal, it affects the parts of the body that relate to it. 
Not free to express myself. What chakra is that? Throat, right? Myself, my heart. So when we look at the tip of the iceberg, and this is like this, this is happening, or this physical problem is there, it's giving you a mirror. This is how it works. It's giving you a mirror of what's really going on. It's giving you a mirror of the mental demon you have that you have to purge. Once you purge that mental demon, then the symptoms go away. Because that's why they're there. Is because it, so that's the cool thing. I mean, we look at life as certain things you know, as negative experiences, but those negative experiences are the mirror that are showing you where the real problems are. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? So you just have to go, whoa. So here, here it's, laid, uh, it's laid out a little bit different. Demons attach to areas according to the associated function. I can't express myself. That's throat and heart chakra imbalances, which lead to hypothyroid hypertension. Energy and emotion fluctuates. Depression equals miserable life followed by death. That's pretty much the process of life for most people, right? They let these mental demons control them, thinking that that's what they're supposed to go through. And even worse, one of these religious things that can be passed on is you're supposed to suffer. You're supposed to suffer through this life to be spiritual, which is insanity to me. I've, I've worked with people that I had to like just let go because they cannot accept and be open to healing because they were under the belief or the misperception that they had to suffer through life. God gave this to me for me to suffer through. God so, gave me this cross to bear. Right. But, but going over what I said today, who gives you that cross? Did God give it to us to suffer through? Or did we accept in some false perception that wasn't correct? We did it to, we're doing it to ourselves. And the cool thing is there is an aspect of grace. If you can ask, remember, God is everything, everywhere, connected to everything. So if you ask with a real purposeful intent, with conscious awareness, not like in a passing like, oh, I wish this would change, that's not going to do shit. Okay? You have to be consciously aware and go, this is what I'm needing help on, God. I've got part of the picture. Help me get the rest of it. Help me move this. And it's like that. It's like the sea that you're in just goes, Psh! and that wave goes out to the end of it. And it's already on its way back. As soon as you've expressed, as soon as you finish expressing what you are saying, it's already on its way back. Now, here's the key: if you've got a bunch of shit in your subconscious mind, you start messing with. You know, if I put a ripple into, say, there's a let's, to, to put limits on this, which is a concept that's that's limited, uh, just to try to explain. Let's say there's a bowl of water, and if I drop my thought into the center of the bowl of water, what does the what does the ripple do? It goes out. It expands from the center. Okay, what happens, when it, what happens when it hits the, the, the boundary? It, it starts to come back, okay? Now, if my subconscious, after I drop that pure intent, if my subconscious is then continually still going like, oh, that'll never happen. What is, what, what's happening? I'm putting another drop in, right? So I've got a wave coming back, and what else? A wave going, a wave going out. out. Which means I cancel the 100% of energy that I could get back. That's exactly how reality works. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I put one thought in, it's already on its way back to me, and then I gotta follow up with a bunch of negative shit. You know, I just, I just kind of, I sit these all these little waves going out, and it slowly kills it. I'm gonna get something back, but it's only gonna be a shadow. Depending on the percentage of negativity I'm putting out, depends on about how much of that can survive, <laughs> survive this crap to get back to me, which is usually kind of small, depending on how aware you are. But you can start working with that and changing it. Does that, does all that I said make sense? So hypertension can go back to the throat chakra being closed off, going back to the mental thought being closed off, going off into the some reality consciousness that I, that I bought into. So the tip of the iceberg, what I'm experiencing in the physical world as a hypothyroidism, is really going back to the demon that's feeding off of me. I cut the demon loose, my body can go back to normal functioning. Like uh, Margarita said, I can go back to my center. But I can't do that until I can cut some things loose, until I can clear that. Good? Is that good on that? Okay. 51. This is the next page here. The Hero's Journey. And I think about Joseph Campbell with this part here. I, really, I haven't read much of his stuff, but I've, I've, I've experienced enough to kind of get what I liked from him. And he talks of being like this reflective collective. He doesn't use those words. But it's like all the stories that people have like passed down. He was like um, this professor who taught on, you know, he's a, taught on... Uh, ancient mythology and things like that. And basically what he says is those stories were representation of things that we did inside. They made sense of things. We all make stories. We all have concepts to try to make reality make sense. So the hero's journey, I turn this into basically a metaphysical aspect here. So this is the picture here. This is a forest. 
And there's a treasure in the center of the forest. There's a giant here. There's a witch. There's some gremlins, a snake, like in the Garden of Eden, and some ghosts. All those characters are actually aspects of ourselves. So the treasure, which is the freedom or power we seek, are located deep in the middle of the mind's forest, the mind's forest. So um, like with uh, the ancient stories, um, mythology, where they always went on a journey, the hero went on a journey to get like a golden fleece or something, then bring it back, the power, that represents us going inside ourselves. All those stories were meant about us finding this. So this treasure is inside of ourselves, but we have to go through our own mental forest where all the little seeming bad things are, right? The trick is that these seemingly bad things are related to us. So below is a m list of the monsters that reside in your internal forest. They really are aspects of yourself. They can help you or hinder you. So sometimes like a witch, they're like known as the trickster, right? They may ask you to do something, and if you do it correctly, they'll give you something. But sometimes they play tricks on you. So, it, it's, it's a, so sometimes they have things for you. They can help or hinder your journey to freedom and power. All of these creatures are allies, so all of them can help you. So your demons, these are just another aspect of your demons. So ghosts, what might ghosts represent if they were just about in your head? Without looking on the sheet. All right. Everybody look on there. So don't look at your sheet. I'm going I'm to question you to see if you can come up. So ghosts represent your past. It's the old stuff that's dead. The past is all dead, right? So when some ghost from the past comes to visit you, that's your own freaking concept of the past. It's just a ghost. It's your mental concept of that, whether it was somebody or an experience. It's a ghost from the past. Uh, giants. What might that be? Things that you've given your power to. Something you made more powerful, bigger than you. So when a giant shows up, it's like, you know, I'm here to you know, take, back take back my power, not run from the giant. The ghost, if it scares you, that's something you have to face to see that that ghost is just a shadow, to see that you can slay the giant, which is really yourself. What about gremlins? I'll give you a hint. What do gremlins do? Like in that Twilight Zone where um, uh, they're flying in the plane, Kirk, from Star Trek, he's the one. To they self-sabotage. Self Gremlins are self-sabotage, and we do it to ourselves. Trolls. I always think about the story of the three billy goats and the troll. They block your forward process. They're like something that's in the way. Um, the snake. That's easy. Just think about Adam and Eve. What did what did it do? Temptation. temptation. It's the parts of you that lead you into temptation, which distract you, right? Uh, witches are, I already mentioned that, the tricksters. They're the parts of you that have knowledge, but they're so twisted that you cannot see them clearly. So these are all aspects in ourselves. Everything on here is the hologram of the story of what's really going on inside of ourselves. <clears throat> so facing these creatures is part of our spiritual journey. So if you've got to get to the treasure in the center of this forest full of all these creatures, what happens typically is we start our spiritual journey and we're going into the forest, and then we run into a few of these and they scare the hell out of us which are really ourselves, and then we retreat. We don't even get the treasure, right? So that's, the, that's what we have to go through. We have to go through ourselves. We have to go through the ignorance and the dark parts of ourselves to find the treasure that's already been inside of us. Like the Wizard of Oz. Exactly. Which is... Huh? We quit coming to group so we don't have to hear it anymore. Yeah. All you've done is you... All you've done is miss... It's the get same it. thing week after week. <laughs> so what you do is you wind up missing getting what you were supposed to be getting. And the funny thing about, you know, thing, knowing about the reflectives, Marsha, and things, the, the whole story about um, the um, Wizard of Oz was actually about the financial system back then. The, the, gold, the gold street was actually gold. The Emerald City, all about money, right? right. It was about the, the people behind the scenes running everything. It, you know, so you, even that changes how you see reality, if you know that, right? So there's a lot more going on than what's really happening in reality. So the whole thing about the Wizard of Oz was about how this guy was writing in code about how the system back then was corrupted in his world, right? All about following the yellow big road. Everybody, everybody following money. Everybody to these, gave their power to the big right. demon head. He was telling everybody that all of us are... Right, right. He was telling everybody that all we're doing is we're following this money that's supposed to lead us to happiness when when we get to the end of it, you learn that the treasure was in you to begin with. Right there. Right where like, this picture shows. So the hero's journey. A call to an adventure. Reluctance happens because we get scared. That's our fears. 
we tend to find a mentor that stimulates the courage. That's always, that's always in the story. So all these little stories, you, you know, they're, they're facing out on the journey. They're facing their fears. They come about somebody that's telling them what to do. Then they have to face the darkness, and they bring back, like the golden fleece, the treasure to help to share with others. And that's the spiritual journey. Every Buddha, every uh, concept like Jesus or a spiritual teacher, they have their journey, then they come back with that to help others do the same journey. That's what it's about. So, um, the devil is in the mental demands. These are mental parasites that feed off of us. So, here you see like the external demon, which is plugging into the, the humanity. And then you have the internal demon, which is plugging into different organs in the body. So, not only does it plug into your, your throat chakra, it plugs into your thyroid. So, the cool thing, though, is when we see what's happening on the tip of the iceberg, we see what's happening in the physical body, it's, it's, made, it's, it's there to show us like, Wow, it's, make us, it's supposed to make us go, what's deeper? Why is this showing up? Not like, you know, getting pissed at God because this showed up, or pissed off at somebody out in the world because this showed up. It's supposed to make you go, whoa, everything is trying to point back to me. So what is this trying to tell me? What am I holding in my mind or my heart that is, not, that is bringing this to me? And if it's not something that I want, then what can I do to bring what I want to me? Does that make sense? And here's a, here's a Pink Floyd song. And, and during this thing, I must have been going through a song thing. Um, and, and it's about being here in the moment. What's it called? Wish you were here. Wish you were here. So, so you think you can tell heaven from hell? I mean, do you really think you can tell heaven from hell? We're actually living it all the time, right? We're, we're in this concept. Yeah, we're, we're going back and forth and we think we know what one is, but we're creating either or. But we think we know. But we, do we really? Blue sky. So what happens is, this, the cool thing about this song is it's talking about we're giving away heaven for hell and we don't even know it. So blue skies for pain. I just give my blue skies away for pain. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail? A smile from a veil? So in other words, somebody's smiling. Is that real or is it fake? Do you think you can tell? And did they get you to trade your heroes for ghosts? So bring in the concept of ghost being the past. Are you trading what you want to bring into the world, your own personal powers for old stuff? A lot of people do, and they don't even know it. They're living hell, and they think they're living heaven. They think they have a choice. 90% of the people on the planet do not have free will. If a mental demon is controlling your thoughts, which is coming from inside of you, you don't have free will. And I have them myself. I don't have complete 100% free will either. I'm working on it, but it's, it's a process you had to consciously work on. Trading hot ashes for trees, hot air for cool breeze, cold comfort for change. And did you exchange a walk-on part in a war for a lead role in a cage? So how many of us walk around life thinking we're free, but we're actually in a cage? Yeah. How I wish, how I wish you were here. And that goes back to the whole thing I started in the beginning with about the time. Here is the only space where none of that exists, where you can change the future and even change the past. But you've got to be in the space that's here now. You're just... We're just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year. In other words, same lost people going over the same bullshit year after year. And if you believe in, in, believe in reincarnation, typically lifetime after lifetime. It's what Buddha talks about, the wheel of life and death. Die, come back, die. Come. When the hell are you going to choose to get off of that? <laughs> get off the hamster wheel. Yeah. <laughs> running, over the same old, running over the same old ground. What have you found? The same old fears. I wish you were here. You see, they wrote this song, though, when their original lead singer was institutionalized for schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's where this one came from. I mean, I love Pink Floyd. So, yeah. But... I mean, but that was... Roger Waters? Yeah, Sid... Sid, what was his name? Yeah. I don't know if they got Roger Waters, Roger Waters was... was uh, um, Sid. There's uh, two things that kind of got from that. Like, yeah. When you talk about the smile, when you didn't even know it's real enough, and it's even uh, it gets conditioned more through us now just because of social media. Oh yeah. Now you could portray yourself like without people want to portray like the, the avatar. Themselves. The avatar. So right. you never know what's really there and what's oh, yeah. not. So mm -hmm. that's how I think people are getting conditioned. Oh yeah. That and and they need their feedback from the feedback. That's a good thing. I mean, did you brought up because. There, there's two concepts of avatar. Okay, when they what what they were doing with the concept, they're perverting the idea of avatar. Even with the movie Avatar, with the blue with the blue people, remember that? 
which is, which is a pretty spiritual movie to me, but they were perverting the concept of Avatar. Avatar is one that can control all five elements. We are made of all five elements, right? So an avatar is someone that can control their, all their, their elements, control themselves, control their consciousness. The airbender, remember that movie? You might see that movie that came out? The airbender, his name is the avatar. Buddha is a representation of the avatar. It's not a false persona that, you know, you go into an online, you can have this false avatar that you have, and everybody thinks you're this person, but all you're doing is pretending. All it is is taking you further from yourself, not closer to yourself. And the perversion of the word avatar, when avatar really means your true self. It means that you realize that you are part of God and never have left that. And in being that, you're, you can control your five elements, which is alchemy. You can control everything about yourself. Not that you force it on reality, because in reality, the secret only gives you half the story. You know, the secret about creating all your consciousness, the secret is about learning how to control yourself. Because once you know how to control yourself, your reality flows. You're not forcing it to go. If you're trying to use the secret and push the elements around you, like, I'm going to push this here and this here, you're not, you're not, you're, we, you're it, was, it was a sidetrack, in a way, like a perversion you're of missing, the, missing the target. yeah, it's like a perversion of the avatar, because what happens, everybody's trying to change that, instead of changing this, which changes that anyway. But it, it's a much easier flow. We're going to have to break some of this up because um, uh, this was the last time we had a lot of time to tap, and this one's going a little bit long. But let me cover this page at least. This is called um, Self Mastery Equals Erasing Negative Programming. The goal of life, and this is just me speaking, and again, I'm just a concept, so don't mind me completely. Uh, the goal of life, <laughs> or to living life to the fullest, I'm just, a, yeah, I'm just an illusion. <laughs> oh, only what resonates with you. Yeah. I'm the, the, I'm the hologram of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Or to living life to the fullest is to be 100% in every moment, being content no matter what is happening. So it's not about being upset or, or uh, happy. It's about being content with what's happening. Being 100% in the moment, you are saturated with every experience and you feel 100% alive. The possibilities of growth are increased when you're in the moment, not living in the past according to the percentage of you that is present in any given moment. Um, for example, it's like, uh, you know, we do, we, most of the actions that we do, we tend to do them fast and we tend to do them unconscious, right? Uh, I've been really practicing eating more consciously, but, you know, I've, I've been done it before. You drive through somewhere, you grab something, you eat it before you've gone 10 minutes, drug, it, that's, you're asleep. You're asleep. You cannot enjoy that. Mm -hmm. It's like having sex, just focus on the yeah. end, <laughs> the end of it, right? But, you know, if you take your time, like just take, take your right hand, just kind of rest your left hand in your lap, and take your right hand and just kind of do like a quick movement up your arm from fingertip to your elbow, okay? Now, now I want you to take that right hand, do the same thing, but I want you to go really slow. Pay attention to what you feel. Does the experience change any? Yeah, it, it changes because you're fucking present, right? <laughs> when you're doing this, there's no presence there. Right. And we're walking around touching each other like that. There's no real thing happening. <laughs> so, so, and that's like sexuality. The, the real powerful, like Tantra, is like you're really trying to be present, and the whole thing is about being, bringing God into the experience, not just boom, 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 you know. Not that some of that's not good, but <laughs> again, again, you gotta have yin and yang. So. <laughs> right. What's the window we're looking at here? Right. So your tapes, your, your viral programs, keep your conscious mind caught up in the past or on the future, and you wind up living in a shell of a life. You miss opportunities because your tapes say you can't do it. There is, an, uh, there is no such thing as a chronic disease, but a chronic disease thinker. So if our conscience, this is from a, a quote from an unknown, so what that's saying is that disease only stays with us because we're chronically thinking the same thing. You know, Jesus, when they were about to stone Mary, um, he told Mary, he says, go and sin no more. And if the sin is really just what we're thinking, he's basically saying, go and don't keep thinking the same stuff that got you where you are. Don't sin against yourself anymore. Don't keep thinking negative things about yourself. So, and I've already gone about the now being here in the present and being the only full presence is here. You have to be right in the center of now. Not thinking about the future, not thinking about the past. Medit so the idea of meditation is... Meditation is meant to not not it, meditation isn't something you're supposed to do every day for 10, 30 minutes or an hour, and that makes you spiritual. The
the practice of meditation is supposed to make it to where you are of a meditative mind 24-7. In your job, whenever you're doing your job, you're there 100%. You're not off thinking about something else. When you're making love, you're 100% there. Whenever you're paying your bills, you're 100%. It's like in Ram Dass's book, and this is a popular quote, he's got a little picture in there, and it's like, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Nothing physically has changed, but your consciousness has changed. Your presence has changed. And th that's a huge thing because it talked about um, Buddha. Uh, one of the things that was said about Buddha is the trees were alive around Buddha. In other words, he was so conscious that reality reacted to him in a different way than it would to anybody else. So being 100% in the present takes time to master. That's the process we're going through. Even if you are in the now, you can still get caught up and polarized seeing things as bad and good. So being here, right here, right now doesn't mean you're completely clear of that yin and yang of good and bad. When you are neutral, you have no charge in what you have to experience and life just flows effortlessly. You still react to it, you're going with the flow and there's less effort, but you still have to sometimes you know, roll a little bit from left to right. Self-mastery steps. Number one is you've got to be mindful. And that's what meditation helps, Zen practices. You have, number one, you have to be conscious. That's, that's why it's like throwing pearls to swine. When you've got this awareness of something and you walk up to a total stranger and you're like, we're going to help everybody. And this is in one of Ram, in Ram Dass's Be Here Now book. There's this picture of this hippie running down the, uh, this church aisle. And he's like throwing flowers and yelling all this. But they're just looking at him like he's crazy, right? So the person has to be consciously aware and seeking to be able to hear anything. Otherwise, you're throwing pearls and swine. So if you're trying to do that with your family, you're trying to do that with your friends, you're just wasting your time. I mean, maybe you are throwing, like another pro uh, uh, proverb is, um, you know, what, where they take the seed and you throw it. Sometimes it's going to land on stones, sometimes it's going to land on fertile ground. Sometimes planting seeds helps. But if you're going around doing it from the ego, you're wasting your time. You've got to be open and aware for the people that show up. So if I'm going around trying to talk to some stranger on the street, all I do is think I'm crazy, and I'm wasting my time. But you got so the person has to be mindful. You have to be mindful. Try to stay present in every moment so you can catch what your subconscious mind is saying. So if you're driving along and a judgmental thought pops up, if you're not conscious, you're going to let that thought keep going, right? But if you're conscious, you're like, what? What the hell is that? <laughs> you know, you catch it, and then you can go, shut up. You know, you can you can remove it. Whether you got to tap yourself or if you got your mind, you can shove it in a pocket. You know, if you can if you're conscious, you can change it. If you're not, it's going to be going all over the place. Two is you've got to consciously purge that from your con subconscious mind. You can't just be aware of it, you've got to do something with it. And this is just a timeline that I made a long time ago, and this is like an infinite time. Um, and basically what's, oh, let me try this. Um, I'm recording this, so I'm trying to make it make it a little bigger. I don't think that was big enough. Ooh. Oh, well, that wasn't big enough. Yeah, that wasn't quite big enough. But <clears throat> so, so let's say this is, this is the growth line here, okay? There's, there's a center line here. Over, above this line, on this side, it's ego growth, okay? On this side, is spiritual growth. So on the beginning side, there's no idea of God or spirit or anything. It's just somebody living day to day. Then there has to um, be something more. You have to start questioning, which means there has to be some amount of consciousness there before you question, right? Um, before you even start moving forward. Then there begins to be an interest in spiritual things. So you're starting to open up. You're starting to transcend. How can I control the world around me? See? So I see the progression there. That's still on the ego side. The transition point, um, the point of crossover from ego-based viewing of reality and spiritual growth is this point of crossover is when you start um, having this concept about coming back to you. It's all about me, what's inside of me. I'm no longer trying to control out there. I'm trying to control what's inside of me. And by controlling what's inside of me, I get in flow with the world. I get in flow with the Tao, the, the path. But then what happens is a desire to control self and take responsibility for life which is the polar opposite of trying to control the world around you, right? That's still in the realm of here. So the secret, 
is like right on the edge. So if you look at the secret as a teaching, it's kind of like dancing on the edge there a little bit, right? It's a little bit, to me, too much sometimes on trying to create what I want in the world. And doesn't all, it out, brings in the concept of being conscious of self, but just a little bit. So it's kind of dancing on the edge there. So there's that progression that happens. So a desire to, con so what happens, you know when you're, you're moved into more of a spiritual realm with your li living, when you're working on trying to control your own self instead of trying to control somebody else or the world around you. That tells you you've made a crossover into the spiritual realm of your living. You start, then the next level is you start letting go of things that prevent you from living life to the fullest in each moment. That has to do with your thoughts, that has to do with life patterns, and those get changed as you become aware of these subconscious things that are there. Because once you've done the crossover into spiritual growth and you're looking at yourself, it, ha it, it demands that you have to do this work. Otherwise, you're back at the ego growth, right? You have to do the, the, the unfun stuff about self. Then there's the thing about gaining control of self, which is basically gaining control of the subconscious. And the very last step is let go of control, which seems a little contradictory. You spend all this time trying to gain control. <laughs> but in the very begin, at the very end, you let go of control, being 100% in the moment. The light of awareness, consciousness, fully illuminates your now or enlightenment. And that goes back to what Margarita is like you're uh, floating on the stream. You're no longer struggling, you're just like floating on it, and life flows and moves perfectly. There's, there's a process to that. There's times, in everybody's life, right in this room right now, there's times where you're floating, and there's times where you're, you know, you're, you're like thrashing around trying to fight something, right? You're trying to swim, oh, the current's taking me there, oh, you know. So, um, so it's, it's a process of learning and going through that. One last thing here. Uh, this is, oh, funny. Back to another collective here. I mentioned that movie earlier, and I forgot this is in here. This is from Jung. That movie, about, uh, A Dangerous Method, but was about Jung, too. What is not integrated from the unconscious cast itself outside as our faith. That's extremely powerful. So whatever in, in our unconscious mind, our subconscious mind, that is not dealt with, which is not integrated within ourselves, which we're not aware of, is casting itself out into the world as our faith, as our reality. Remember bringing in the seams information, the event horizon, you know, like on a black hole, the event horizon is the events that we are creating that are coming on, that are on the horizon of our life. So, and our consciousness is doing that. I just want to go over this so you can be thinking about it. When we're tapping, so there we have the little tip of the iceberg, right? And all those little black things in there are like little cassette tapes. Those are like the little little things and little thoughts inside of you. So you have to be conscious of what you're looking for. Then you dive down into the unconscious. So let's say one of these tapes is, I'll never amount to anything. So your life is showing you that because you're not amounting to much. <laughs> so you want to start changing that. You dive down into here, you grab a hold of that tape, and you work to cast it out of your consciousness. It's not just about rewriting it. Rewriting it's only going to get you so far. It's like hitting the record. So, so somebody else, is, you know, like your mom said, uh, or your dad, let's say an, an alcoholic father, and this is literally how um, programming happens. And I'll, I'll use the top of her head so you can see it. And this is not going on physically, but energetically it is. You'll never amount to much. So let's say this is happening over and over when they're like going through childhood. You'll never amount to much. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to much. So every time I'm doing this, what I'm saying is being recorded in her consciousness. Even, even, Literally. Even if it's subtle. Yeah. yeah, even if it's subtle. The more, even a subtle thing, the more it's repeated over and over and over and over and over and over, the deeper it goes. Those become, those exact same takes are what we're playing in the back of our mind 24 7. So I can sit here with an affirmation of I'm worthy. And I can start taping over some of it. But if that's been recorded and you've got 20 tapes on that, it's going to take quite a bit of time to re to record it. Mm -hmm. With EFT, where I'm bridging all this into, is you go down there, you look at the tape, you start looking at all the aspects around it, and you're working on burning the sucker, not just taping back over it. I don't want, a, maybe positive affirmations are good, but they don't get you all the way. Because positive affirmations sometimes just cover up something. Now, you, now let's say you had a complete, uh, you made, let's say you made a really good tape, I'm wealthy, or let's see, I'm worthy, I'm worthy, I'm worthy, but then you still got another tape in here that's saying, you're a piece of shit. So sometimes that one's going to play, sometimes this one's going to play. It's better just to burn suckers, right, than try to make positive ones. Mm -hmm. But positive are sometimes better, but they don't, it doesn't overweigh getting rid of all of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it just kind of brings up. 
Well, it's kind of like another analogy that would be like if you're writing something, if you write the same sentence over and over, over the, over the same words yeah. every time, it gets deeper and deeper. Yeah, deeper. you try to erase even it. Even if you go back and erase yeah. it, there's you still, still see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if I you like take that. a piece of paper and you burn it, then you don't have it anymore. Yeah. That's a good analogy. There was a book that, still that. Deborah, <laughs> Deborah had let me borrow a while back, and several of the exercises that it had you do was write 25 times you know, you had to create an affirmation or you had to create a statement mm -hmm. or whatever. And it was like, in your journaling, write 25 times whatever mm -hmm. that statement was that you came up with. And, yeah. You know, and so it's like I can still look back through my journal and find where it's just one entire page is nothing but this one mm -hmm. one statement. You know, that, yeah, so. and, and that works. It's, it yeah. just Because every, everything like that, to me, you can't throw it all out. I'm just saying, if sometimes if you stop, if you stop just there, which I don't think she has, then what happens is sometimes it doesn't get all of it. And then you've got partly a tape going, you know. And but it's better than nothing, for God's sakes. At least you worked well, on I mean, it. You know? I can, but I can go back and I can see yeah. it. And I can read. Yeah. You know. And that's really cool. Jur journaling is very powerful. If you keep yeah. a record of what you've tapped on or what you've gone through spiritually, it's really cool to go back, and you can see where maybe you're even repeating a pattern you thought you were done with, or you can say, "Wow, I'm done with that. I'm, I don't have that problem." So it helps you, you can read it move forward. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like the visual though. It, it helps me understand better how to pull out. Yeah, because I'm going back to her. I started with the whole arc, the conscious mind. Right. So that's reaching, we're reaching, with the tapping, we're reaching into the subconscious mind. That's why the crazy stuff when we're working comes up. Because I'm not working with the conscious mind. I'm trying to go as deep as I can. And we're pulling that sucker. So it's like pulling that screaming little belief out into the light like a vampire and letting it blow the hell up, right? right. That's what we want it. And remember, darkness is simply ignorance. Yeah. Light is Lack of light. They were even talking about light. You know, that's why they God talk. This is an evil. It's yeah. lack of light. And that's why they talk. They refer to light being spiritual, or God of light. It's like light is what's illuminating all the negative things. So this is how it works. The steps onto clearing your mind is first you got to be conscious in every moment. We're not there, but we're working there. So you got to be conscious of the problem, catch your negative thoughts, and then neutralize your negative thoughts. Neutralize them, or rewrite them, or preferably burn them. But at least one of those three, they're, it's, it's, it's going to speed up your growth that way. And sometimes whenever you're affirming something and if nothing changes, there's something up because you know there's something else underneath. Yeah, that. other layers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually it's, it's like an onion. You know, sometimes you don't rip everything all at once. There's layers to it. And the cool thing about tapping, what I've experienced with myself, is you clear something, but then you get to experience a little higher level of that. Let's say you're in a crappy relationship that's really negative, and that's based on your perception of the, the relationship you saw with your own parents. You're kind of repeating the pattern, right? But you change that, then you kind of get to upgrade. But then you live the upgrade for a while, and it's like, I think I can upgrade a little more. You know? so, you, so you get to, you know, the, on the positive side is there's no end limit to where you want to go. And this comes from the Bhagavad Gita. And this Bhagavad Gita means songs of God. Use all your power, this is really powerful to me, use all your power to free the senses from attachment and aversion alike and live in the full wisdom of the self. Such a sage, sage awakens to light in the night of all creatures. That which the world calls day is the night of ignorance to the wise. So such a sage awakens the light in the night of all creatures. We all have night within us, but the more light you have, it's like you radiating the people and can lighten up even their dark spots. So, yeah, I do too. Bhagavad Gita is a pretty hard read, but there's some pieces in there I like. Um, that's what talking about Krishna and uh, things like that. Uh, okay, I might as well finish this part here. <laughs> This is this is this uh, yeah this is the, and this is just a simp and this is just and this is just to bring another another layer to this about the tapping stuff. So we, again we have the remember the conscious mind here and the subconscious sub sub and then of course God consciousness. So uh, when you when you use an uh, affirmation, there is a subconscious recognition of not liking where you are. So in other words, when you use an affirmation, you're acknowledging there's something you don't like and you're trying to change it. That's a good thing. You've got to be aware of that. So when you use an affirmation, you're affirming your negative state as well. That's the negative part of that. So for example, um, let's say I'm saying, I'm, I start saying I'm wealthy and wise. Okay? I would say that, why would I start saying, uh, let's, let's focus on one thing. Let's say um, I'm wealthy. Why would I ever want to start saying the affirmation I'm wealthy? 
Because you're because not. Because you, you visualize yourself being poor. Right. Whether I'm experiencing it or feeling it, I'm some part of me is feeling like it's not wealthy. Okay. So what, what I'm trying to bring, I'll, I'll bridge this by saying this: If I had a million dollars, okay, and I had plenty of money in the bank, I had no money worries. Would I ever have to think about saying, I'm wealthy? No. So whenever you draw to say an affirmation, you know that it's already coming from a sense of lack, right? Because if I was a millionaire, I would never have to think about saying, it would be a waste of my time. Why would I even spend the energy on saying I'm wealthy if I already freaking was, right? So be aware that affirmations do already come from a negative space of lack. They are helpful, but they're still coming from a space of lack. I was reading that in today, uh, Spiritual Prosperity Laws. Really? Talk talks about that. Cool. Um, so, this is like an affirmation, I'm happy. Okay, see the little arrow? That's what the conscious mind is saying, I'm happy. And then down here, you may have more than one. Yeah, my life sucks, I feel so alone, no one, I can't read on my screen, no one will ever love me, I don't deserve to be happy. That's a lot of ammunition coming at that small little affirmation you may say five times that day, right? That's not quite going to be enough. The thing about EFT is I love and accept my mind and body. Then you're reaching down, and this is what we're doing when we say something negative, even though my life sucks, then pulling it back into the light. So in other words, you're acknowledging the negative at the same time. You're not trying to cover over it. It's not like, oh, here's a pile of shit, and I'm going to rub gold flake over it. No. <laughs> it's not going to work, right? It's still a <laughs> It's still going to stink, right? <laughs> but it's pretty. <laughs> it looks good. You feel like an antique plate. You got golden poo, yeah? Um, but but, but that, that's sometimes what we do. So we have to go in there, acknowledge that, and then work to pull it up. Sometimes we pull a piece up, one layer, and then we work later, we have to see some more, we can go deeper. But the awareness has to be there to be able to go down. So 10% is conscious. Conscious, again, is living consciously in the moment. 90%, for most people, is living unconscious with program responses. These are beliefs and perceptions about life and self. These come from parents, teachers, peers, life experiences. These are affirmations your subconscious tells you 24-7. All of this uh, unknown information runs your life. So you're not just saying, like, I'm happy. You say that affirmation 20 times a day. All these other affirmations are going 24-7. It's like a tape, that tape that we did earlier, that's just on loop. It never stops. How can you fight that completely just with affirmations alone? It helps. You kind of like skip them up, or, but it doesn't get rid of it all the degree it needs to. So that, that big loop, it's like, um, it's like accepting yourself even all these things are, are happening. It's like, still okay, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. You're, it's, You're it's, forgiving yourself. Yeah. It's, right. In a way, there's lots of different layers that go in there. It's like, it's like you're acknowledging what's going on, you're not trying to cover over it. And, and then when we're, when we're doing tapping groups, uh, Margarita, we, we pull in lots of other aspects because we'll be looking at the body like, okay, then we'll bring in things that people weren't, weren't really aware of before, which helps them see a lot more into the unconscious, which pull, so we're not just going in there into the unconscious and pulling out a handful. And, and the image that comes to me is like, I like, you know when sand is wet, how sand is, like you pick it up and it's kind of falling through your fingers? Yeah. Sometimes it's like that, you're trying to like, pull this stuff up and it's like you get a little bit, you know, you throw it out of your mind, and you go in like this, but when we go in there, we're picking all these aspects of like, this relates to, oh, my mom told me that, that's why I'm doing that in this relationship. It's like taking like a, <coughs> you're pulling a lot more out. You're going to get a lot more quicker, faster. It's not going to take as long. And we've seen that in group. Uh, again, I wrote this again because it's so powerful. Pleading for health with his mouth, yet ordering illness with his thoughts. To the degree that you successfully address an issue, like I'm sitting here pulling this out, if I can only, put tw if I can only pull 20% of it out, that's how much it's going to change in my life. The good thing is, is at least it changed 20%, but I want to go for all the way, right? Uh, the deeper you go, the better. With mean, or EFT, which some of these EFT means is my form of it, you're not erasing memories, you're breaking down involvement. So it's about going in there and like erasing and burning the tape out, not just writing over it. You're acknowledging the problem and then working to get rid of it. Not just like, okay, here's a pile of shit, and I'm just gonna, I'll make it look pretty. Because um, nobody would still want to have that, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> Something stinks in here, in my brain. Uh, so we're going to end, any questions there? I'm going to end there. I'll post it on YouTube probably by tomorrow.